a little girl, my mother said to me, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. And I have learned in my life that everyone has God-given gifts. Women do better where they are paid for their real value, their real contributions, what they produce. Women do better in those environments because women frequently come to the workforce later. They sometimes leave the workforce to care for their families. And yet, government jobs, union jobs pay on seniority, time and grade. That harms women. By the way, seniority systems, big government jobs, union jobs are the litany of the left, whereas a meritocracy is what the private sector, if they are enlightened, and many are, are focused on. Meritocracies are what got me from a secretary to a CEO. We need to unlock the potential of this nation and restore possibilities to every American, regardless of their circumstances, because I know that every American has God-given gifts, and with those gifts should come possibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, 2016 presidential candidate Carly Fiorina. to be back with you here today. You know what was going on while you were here in the convention center today? While you were meeting here, Hillary Clinton was meeting the FBI. Now, I don't know. I don't know if you're a betting person. I'm betting she won't get indicted. How about you? But think about this. Think about where we've come as a nation that a presidential candidate, the nominee of one of the major parties in this nation, has a three and a half hour interview with the FBI. And nobody seems to think there's anything all that unusual or wrong with that. I remember the Benghazi report finally came out. Trey Gowdy, gosh, talk about a guy with a tough job. Trey Gowdy, yes, applaud for Trey Gowdy, who did a great job. <laughs> Trey Gowdy finally comes out with his Benghazi report, and what's the reaction of the media and most of the nation? Kind of ho-hum. The headlines say, no new evidence of wrongdoing. And yet, what was crystal clear from that report is that Hillary Clinton and a lot of other people, but Hillary Clinton for sure knew that this was a purposeful terrorist attack on the anniversary of 9-11 in which four Americans, including our ambassador, were murdered and she gets up the next day and for the next several days and says, no, it was a videotape. It's stunning, isn't it? And she's the nominee of the Democrat Party. It makes you wonder, honestly, it makes you wonder whether we've forgotten who we are as a nation, that such a thing could be going on in this nation. But I'll tell you the thing that makes me craziest of all the things, I mean, let's face it, Hillary Clinton makes us all crazy, but the thing that makes me, you can applaud, it's all right, she makes us all crazy. But the thing that makes me crazier than almost anything is when Hillary Clinton and other women start talking about feminism. That really drives me crazy. You know, I've been called, I literally have been called by so-called feminists, an enemy of women. So, you know, <clears throat> feminism is not an ideology. It's not feminist to tell someone else what to think or what to believe. That's called intimidation, not feminism. Here's my definition of feminism. A feminist is any woman who chooses to use every single one of her God-given gifts and who chooses her life, whether that's to have six kids and homeschool them or become a CEO. A feminist is someone who uses all of her God-given gifts and chooses her own life and her own path. And Mrs. Clinton, as a feminist, I'm not voting for you.
Now we have, you know, kind of a progressive gaggle right now, right? We have Obama and Sanders and Warren and Clinton. And they're going around talking about how they care so much about people. But here's the truth, and you know it, and we have to make sure that America knows it. You know what progressivism is? You know what it really is? It is the tyranny of the few over the many. That's what progressivism is. It is the concentration of too much power in too few hands. Hillary Clinton, of course, is not just a progressive. She's not just a liar. She's corrupt. She and her husband have made their millions selling access and influence. Here's the truth, though. For someone to sell access and influence, somebody's got to be buying. And there are lots of people who've been buying that access and influence. Chromany capitalists, among others. The truth is, for all that divides our nation, as I told you last year and as I've said many times, the truth is, for all of the divisions in this nation, we have found common ground over one very important thing. And that is that the American people now believe that the federal government is incompetent and corrupt and that politics is incompetent and corrupt as well. Now, we need to be honest with ourselves. The progressives aren't the only ones that are corrupt. As Republicans, we've been corrupt, too. We've sometimes presided over a growth of government. We've sometimes engaged in crony capitalism. And so while I worry about our nation forgetting who we are sometimes, I worry most about us as conservatives and Republicans forgetting who we are. Because here's the thing, our faith tells us, common sense tells us, our experience tells us that a victory at all costs is no victory at all. And that the ends do not justify every means. And so I think it's really important as we battle a progressive ideology which we must defeat in November all up and down the ticket. As we battle that ideology, I think it's really important that we as conservatives and Republicans, that we remember who we are. Because, you know, the one thing we know from the history of this nation, if we think about who we are and where we came from, this is a nation built on ideas and ideals. This is a nation that has endured because of values and principles. And so we, as conservatives, must remember who we are, what our ideas and our ideals are, what our principles and our values are. And so when I want to kind of remind us who we are tonight, and to do that, I want to start, actually, a long way from here in Denver. In January of 2015, before I had become a presidential candidate, I served as chairman of two major charities in this country. One of them is called Opportunity International. Opportunity International, some of you may know it, that's fantastic is a Christian-based organization, but it is the largest private microfinance organization in the world. Microfinance, the lending of very small amounts of money to very, very poor people. We have lent $8 billion, $100 at a time, and lifted millions and millions of people out of poverty. Now, in January of 2015, I traveled to the slums of New Delhi. I was holding a global board meeting in New Delhi, India. And at the end of that board meeting, I wanted to go visit with some of our clients. And so I traveled to the slums. I don't know how many of you have been in the slums of New Delhi, but they are pretty grim places. Mountains of trash, marauding animals, sewage in the streets, people piled on top of each other. It is a desperate place. And as I climbed a ladder to get to the top of a roof to sit down with 10 of our clients, I steeled myself because what I thought I would see was desperation in their eyes, the same desperation that I saw all around them. But as I sat with these 10 people, I did not see desperation. I saw focus. I saw determination. 
I saw pride. I saw hope. Why? Because these clients, they were all women, by the way, these clients were making something of their lives. They were building something important. One woman proudly told me how her husband and her in-laws were a little concerned about her taking a $100 loan and trying to start her own business. And I said, well, how do they feel about it now? And she said, they feel good. They work for me. <laughs> now, why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because and I could tell you thousands like it, because I've had a great privilege to travel and work and live all over the world, to see people in all kinds of circumstances. And I can tell you that no matter people's circumstances, everyone is gifted by God. Everyone has the potential, the capacity, the desire to build a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. Most people want to. We know that dignity comes from work done well. And so people need the opportunity to work. We know that family brings purpose. And so we know that when family structures break down, people lose their way. And we also know that meaning comes from a spiritual foundation. So when people no longer have an opportunity to work, and we have record numbers of men out of work in this country today, when people's families are falling apart, when we have record numbers of women living in poverty, when people have lost a connection with the spiritual, people lose their way. Now, I ask you, if it is true, my mother taught me this so many years ago, that each of us are gifted by God. She told me that in Sunday school one morning when I was eight years old. She looked at me and the rest of her class, and she said, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. And it is true. <laughs> it is true that everyone is gifted by God. So if that is true, if it is true that every life is filled with potential and promise and possibility, usually far more than any of us realize, if that is true, why is it that more things have been more possible for more people from more places here than anywhere else on earth? Why is it true that it is only in this nation that a young woman could start out the way I did typing and filing and answering the phones for a nine-person real estate firm in the middle of a deep recession in the 70s, go on one day to become the chief executive of the largest technology company in the world and run for the presidency of the United States. Why is that only true here? And believe me, it is only possible here. Why is that? Why is it only possible here? Why is it that this nation became a place where people's lives were not defined by their circumstances? Why is it that this nation became a place where people's possibilities were not defined by who they are, or how they start, or even where they come from, or what their last name is, or what they look like? This is the only country on the face of the earth and in all of human history where your possibilities in life are determined solely by opportunity and God-given gifts. Nowhere else on earth is that true. And the question is why? Because that is what is at stake in this nation. That is what we cannot forget. You know, I started thinking about what we might be forgetting when I observed the results of the Brexit vote. So, 52% of the people in the UK voted for national sovereignty. And it's interesting, if you look at the polls from that vote, what you'll see is that it was, generally speaking, older people who voted to exit the EU, and younger people who voted to stay, and that got me thinking. Maybe a lot of the young people in the UK don't remember a time of national sovereignty. Maybe they don't remember a time when so much of their life was overtaken by this big, bloated, unaccountable bureaucracy sitting mile miles away. 
Thank goodness we have so many young people here who understand the foundation of the Constitution <laughs> and this great nation. And we need to look to the young people here and those like you all over this country, as well as all of us here, to remember who we are. So why is it that this is the only nation on the face of the earth where one's possibilities are not defined by one's station in life or one's origin or one's last name? It's because our founders understood two very important things. They founded a nation on two fundamental ideas. Now, I have to tell you that I started out as a history major. And one of the things you learn from history is something that I think our founders knew, because our founders were also students of history and students of philosophy. And when you study history, you learn something. You learn that human nature doesn't change. Times change, values change, cultures change, but human nature doesn't change. And in fact, history is the story of power. Economic power, military power, political power. History is the story of who has power, who wants power, who loses power, who gains power. Our founders were actually consumed with concern about power. The two fundamental ideas that our nation was founded on, the first one, the one my mother taught me, the one that I learned when I looked into those women's eyes in the slums of New Delhi, each of us are gifted by God. All of us have the capacity to live lives of dignity and purpose and meaning. All of our lives are filled with possibilities. Our founders knew that too. And so they said, in this nation, and it was a radical idea, in this nation, they said, each of us has a right a right to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness. That was their way of saying we all have a right to fulfill our potential. And they said, this was the radical part. They said that right comes from God and cannot be taken away by man or government. But our founders knew something else, too. I said they were consumed by a concern for power, and they were. And they knew, having studied history, having been through what they had been through, they knew that power concentrated is power abused. Power concentrated is power abused. It has always been true, and it is true now. We have too much power concentrated in the hands of too few. Too much money, too much power. And that is why our nation has become one that works really well if you're wealthy or well-connected or powerful. If you can hire armies of accountants and lawyers and lobbyists. And yet, we have a federal government that is so powerful, so big, and it is as well as Americans have figured out incompetent and corrupt. Power concentrated is power abused. And so they wrote the Constitution, not just to enshrine our rights and liberties, but to prevent the concentration of power. It is what the Ninth and Tenth Amendment are all about. You know, but we have to remind this nation from now till November and every day going forward. We must remind this nation that the Constitution exists not just to protect our rights and liberties, but to prevent the concentration of power. And the only way to fix what ails us is to return to those fundamental ideals of the Constitution of this great nation and restore power where it belongs. Now, you know, <clears throat> ours was intended to be a citizen government, right? Of, by, and for the people. Ours was intended to be a citizen government. We are a very long way from that now. And it is incumbent upon us as citizens. We cannot stand back and ask our politicians to do all this for us because, some, frankly, some of the politicians don't want to do it for us. It is our job as citizens. You know, Mark Twain had an interesting observation about Independence Day. We're coming up on Independence Day. What a fantastic time to hold this summit. 
Mark Twain reminded us at Independence Day. He said, each of us has a patriotic duty to stand up and speak. Each of us has a patriotic duty, a duty as a citizen to stand up and fight for what we believe is right. And that is true. We must be a movement. We must be, as Republicans, a party that always stands for the restoration of power where it belongs, not in the hands of bureaucrats, not in the hands of the wealthy and the well-connected, but instead in the hands of citizens and families and communities and small businesses and entrepreneurs all across this great nation. That must be what we stand for. And we must be the party of reform as well. We cannot simply preside over a slowing in the growth of government bureaucracies. You know, I've spent most of my business career tearing down bureaucracies. I know a lot about bureaucracies. And here is the fundamental that I've learned about bureaucracies, and you know it as citizens of this great nation as well. If you give a bureaucracy more and more money, have no standards for performance, have no accountability, what do you suppose you're going to get? You're going to get incompetence and corruption. But more than that, a bureaucracy feeds on itself. A bureaucracy keeps feeding itself. A bureaucracy keeps asking for more money, more power, more control. We cannot be a movement or a party that simply lets that go on. We have to be a movement and a party that slashes those bureaucracies and demands reform. We are finally at a time and an era where we actually can do that. You see, we live in the 21st century. We live in the age of technology. All of you have your smartphones out there. Do you know when the first iPhone was introduced? I know it seems amazing to think. The first iPhone was introduced in 2007 less than a decade ago. Think about the changes that have been wrought by technology. Now, technology has its dark side, I am willing to admit. A lot of nasty things get said with technology. But the truth is, technology is the most powerful tool ever devised for democratization. The truth is, each citizen has in their hands an incredibly powerful tool, not only to get information, but to hold people accountable. There really actually is no excuse for not reforming these bureaucracies and restoring a citizen government anymore, because technology gives us the power to do so. Technology gives us the power to let every citizen know exactly what's going on. Technology gives us the power to hold people accountable. Technology gives us the power to engage citizens never, as never before in the process of their government, but we must do it. I'm going to spend all my time, have been since I exited the race, not only helping Senate and congressional candidates, but talking to people about the importance of citizen government. And in the end, it is up to us. I have to tell you another story, this one not so far away from home. In fact, I'm reminded to tell you this story because of the little clip that got played. You will notice in that clip where I was wearing the red dress, I was talking really fast. And the reason I was talking so fast is because I was having an argument with Whoopi Goldberg on The View. You gotta work hard to get your point of view across on The View. I went on The View twice. The second time I went on um, was after they'd called me a liar over Planned Parenthood. Of course, as you know, I wasn't lying. Really, <laughs> progressives, want, progressives want to tell us that an unborn life has no value, but its brain, its lungs, and its heart do. We need to remember who we are. I have to pause and digress for a moment. 
this progressive ideology. I was approached by a 17-year-old girl at a campaign stop. And she came up to me and she said, why do you hate transgender and LGBT people? I said, why do you think I hate anyone, including LGBT people? She said, well, I read it. Where'd you read it? The internet. I said, well, do you believe everything you read in the internet? No, no, but this made sense to me, she said. I said, why? Well, because you're pro-life. Now, that may not seem like a logical segue to you, but see, to this young woman, there's a litany. There's a litany of left-wing causes that she'd been fed. And if you deviate from that long list of causes, then somehow you hate people or you're not really a feminist. So I said to her, you know, have you ever known anyone who was pregnant? Oh, yeah. I said, have you watched them? Have you watched their belly grow? Have you ever put your hand on their belly? Yeah. I said, so are you so sure that's not a life? Because I'm pretty sure it is. Now, why does that make me hate anyone? I also say to young people all the time, think about what you can do with that smartphone I just mentioned. I said, think about how you feel when you get in that device. How do you feel? You feel in control. You're in charge. You're empowered. You can do anything you want. You can communicate with anybody you want. You can go anywhere you want. You can learn anything you want. You are in charge. Now, how did you feel the last time you went to the DMV? <laughs> How'd you feel? Did you feel in charge? Did you feel in control? Did you feel empowered? Did you feel valued at all? Did anyone even look you in the eye when they took your number? Kids, that's a bureaucracy. Why do you want more of that? So let me return to the view. The first time I went on the view, the second time was kind of a fight, but the first time I went on the view, they'd never met me before. We had quite a nice conversation. And <clears throat> a little bit through this conversation, one of their hosts, Rosie Perez, we were talking about Vladimir Putin and my meeting with him, and she sort of stopped herself and she said, you know, Carly, I really like you. She sounded surprised. She said, you know, I'm not a Republican. I said, wow, Rosie, I'm shocked. I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> Why are you? She asked me. Why are you? And that is the question we must answer. It is not enough to not want Hillary Clinton. We must know why we are conservatives why we are Republicans and what we stand for. And so I said to her, Rosie, I know that no one of us is any better than any other one of us. Each of us are gifted by God. All of us have the capacity, the desire to live lives of dignity and purpose and meaning. And I know that our values and our principles and our policies work better to lift people up regardless of their circumstances. It is not what progressives believe, Rosie. Progressives believe some are smarter than others, some are better than others, some don't have that capacity to live a life of dignity and purpose, and so some of us are going to decide for the rest of us. And if you doubt that, consider what the head of the Chicago Public Teachers Union said when they were striking. The issue was teacher accountability. And she took to the microphones and said, we cannot be held accountable for the performance of students in our classroom because too many of them are poor and come from broken families. What was she saying? That if you're poor and you come from a broken family, you can't learn, we don't need to teach you, but don't worry, we'll take care of you. That is the height of disrespect and disregard for our fellow citizens. It is not what we believe. We must be a movement and a party that works hard every day to restore a citizen government, to restore power where it belongs, back in individuals' hands, families' hands, communities' hands, small businesses' and entrepreneurs' hands. We must harness the power of technology to hold these bureaucracies accountable and cut them down to size. That must be what we stand for.
We are the party of Lincoln. We are the party of Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln stood on a blood-soaked battlefield, and he begged his fellow citizens to fight so that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our calling as citizens of this great nation to ensure that we always remember who we are and that this, the most noble experiment in all of human history, shall not perish from this earth. God bless you all. Thank you. God bless you. Independence Day.